Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Economic Truth Report number 26. And today we got a real treat. Uh, one of my really good friends, uh, David Morgan of the Morgan Report. And of course, uh, uh, you know, introducing David Morgan, probably 95% of everybody that's listening to this, uh, you know, our, our show here will know who David is and, and probably follow his newsletter even and so on. But David, you know, the, uh, if a little bit of an introduction, you know, David came from the uh, financial industry back in the day and, uh, you know, has been on a mission probably the last couple of decades of, you know, telling people uh, about uh, the reality of our, our monetary system and waking people up. Because uh, if if you really studied history, you know, you, you get to see that there's a big problem uh, that we're facing right now and uh, it's not going to go away. So guys like David uh, Morgan is really trying to educate people and and everybody should uh subscribe to his newsletter which is the morganreport.com and and there's lots of other stuff but i'll leave that up to uh, david throughout the show here to tell you guys uh other things that he that is up to and where you could go to find all of his stuff but uh welcome to the show david well, john thanks for having me it's good to see you again <laughs> yeah it's been a while it's uh you know i i really enjoy uh there's been a few uh probably uh like a handful of interviews that we've done now, both me and both with uh, Josh at World uh, Ultra, uh, at World Alternative Media there, and so on. It's been uh, great to get to know you, and and uh, you're a man of your word. You know, there's uh, there's a lot of people out there, uh, but there's uh, probably a few dozen people that you know really are uh, strong men, if you can call it that, that don't let themselves get manipulated by you know power or, or the money that you know gets pushed their way. And uh, David Morgan is definitely one of those people in my life that I know uh, that I really look up to. And uh, it's kind of like a mentor, not that you mentor me directly, but really just follow what you do and uh, and uh, trying to uh, educate myself from all of your work as well, because you're you're a true, uh, true hero uh, to, you know, the truth community. And, and to, uh, of course, uh, you educated uh, hundreds of thousands of people when it comes to uh, silver, especially, which you're an expert on. And so uh, let's, uh, you know, let's get into it, David. Uh, let's talk about uh, what, what is on your heart right now when it comes to the economy. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get quickly into solutions. But let's talk quickly about, you know, what, uh, what do you think uh, that is the most uh, pressing right now uh, in the economy, especially, uh, well, in the world, but, you know, generally in the United States? Well, I think one of the main things is the reality that the physical economy is contracted. And I've made this statement before, John, but it bears repeating. And that is there was really no correlation anymore between the financial markets and the physical economy. There used to be. I mean, if you go back to the Dow theory, you would have the Dow Jones Industrials, Transportations and Utilities. And based on those averages, you had a pretty good idea how the real physical economy was doing. Those days are long gone. All we have now is a massive amount of uh, derivatives and these uh, paper chases and this funny money that goes into the stock market and pushes the averages higher and higher. And people think or are taught to believe that if they have a strong number or a number that's increasing, that the economy must be doing. So we've had massive problems in since the illness with uh, shortages, supply chain breakdowns, food supply uh, or, or food warehouses and uh, facilities, processing plants that have miraculously burned to the ground here in the States. So there's a big food issue. Uh, food prices have increased dramatically here as they are basically globally. And I think that's one of my main concerns is, you know, the fact that food costs so much is gonna to continue to cost more. And another thing is the global economy. And for the global economy or this new world order that it's often referred to, I have a, a different take on it, John. And the reason being is that Russia has been ostracized. They're out. They're persona non grata. And many people talk about the CBDC. I know I'm covering a lot of ground, but I know your audience is very sophisticated and probably know most of what I'm talking about. But the idea that the CBDC is total control, you could tax trace and uh, look at everything that you're doing. That's all true. And oh, they could shut off your funds. Yes. But the US government shut off the funds of Russia and they picked out the uh, truckers in your country mm -hmm. and said, you know, uh, you're persona non grata because you have the 
you know, freedom to express yourself, but not if you do something I don't want, we're cutting out your bank account. So you don't need a CBDC to show how much the money powers have and what they'll do to get their own way like a bunch of babies. So that is a big concern. So coming back to Russia, I think since there's been an alliance with the BRICS, and I'm not a big proponent of the BRICS being another currency source. I think it's a way to escape it. But nonetheless, uh, it's basically breaking apart in the physical economy and the global uh, new world order. I don't think, you know, how are you going to put Russia back together when we sanctioned them and took basically their funds away? I say we, I mean the United States. So a lot to think about, John, and I want your thoughts as well. But that's my main concerns is the basics of life have been curtailed by what I'll call the, uh, the powers that shouldn't be. And uh, we're going to suffer the consequences. Yeah, no, 100%. It's, uh, I, I'm getting pretty scared about, like, I think we're heading for a reset. Uh, uh, there's, like, multiple indicators of that. You know, there's the actual physical contraction of of the uh, the, the so-called money supply. You know, like, you can't really call money all these digits and everything. Money is gold, in my point of view, or silver, not, not the trash that they... Uh, you know, having paper assets uh, that's dangling around everywhere. Uh, so, like, I, I foresee that, you know, you've seen the physical, uh, uh, well, the, the digital supply of currencies is, is contracting. That's the uh, first time since the Great Depression. You have also uh, another one was uh, that, you know, for only third time in in modern history, you had uh, both bonds and, and um, stocks yielding negative. Um, and what is interesting here, I try to, you know, follow the general public, you know, and, and see what they're up to. What, what I, I talk to people here, like you see in the, in the financial uh, economy, talking about that, you know, like, oh, it looks so great. You know, the stock markets are doing okay. Uh, everything is fine. And, and then you look at the real economy. I talk to people on the street. I talk to people that I, I, I have regular jobs. I work with people that, you know, have regular jobs and, uh, and they're blue collar workers, a lot of them. And uh, you get to hear that, you know, they're starting to struggle to pay for food. They're starting to struggle to pay for the mortgages because of increased interest rates. Um, and um, I, I think like what is happening right now is just a way for the elite to really like, I, I think they want an opportunity for a reset and they just want the system to fail. Uh, I just don't see like how they would cut interest rates uh, you know, it's current point. Maybe they'll do it, try to kick cat down the road again uh, and do their insane policies and then bail out whatever derivatives fail. Uh, that could be, you know, that they, they're trying to do that. But I, I foresee more of a reset. I, they're just like too much like talk by the elites now, uh, by everybody about some form of reset. You know, uh, um, what they're probably looking at is a fiat reset into, you know, potentially central bank digital currency. Uh, they got to scare people by losing all their money if they're going to get them into CBDCs because trying to get people into a, a central bank digital currency is going to be really, really hard uh, because we've been working uh, really hard, me, Dave Morgan, and hundreds of others, been working really hard to educate people. And, and people are starting to resent the government itself now. You're starting to hear a lot of you know resentment towards the government and trust in the government has evaporated, especially here in Canada after you know what uh, Trudeau did to... Uh, everybody that he just didn't didn't like. <laughs> so I think we're seeing that uh, talking about the Russia thing. It's it's quite interesting because I um, when I was in Norway, in Norway you're forced to be in the military, and uh, I I went up for a whole year. I was at the Russian Norwegian border, and I had a NATO secret clearance. <laughs> so I actually the reason why we had the NATO secret clearance is because we can watch every single ship in the NATO forces uh, on a map because I had to have that positioning because I needed to tell, I was sitting at the operation center. So I needed to tell, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the armies of NATO and then coordinate with the United States. They didn't tell me that, but it was pretty easy to figure out uh, what was going on the Russian border, like full of subs, like, is that our sub or is that the Russian sub or, uh, you know, is that a Russian military bo a vessel or is that ours and so on? Um, and uh, when I was up there, it was uh, quite curious because right now up there, 
Uh, they put up the NATO missile shield on the border. Uh, that wasn't there when I was there. Uh, another thing that's very interesting, uh, Kirkness, the, the main city up there, is actually very dependent on Russian middle class that comes from Murmansk over to do uh, economic trade. Well, now it's uh, uh, Kirkness, from what I heard and from what I've seen and, and heard reports of, is turning into a ghost town because none of the middle class Russians are allowed into Norway anymore to do a uh, free market economic trade <laughs> with each other. Uh, so I think they really want to take out Russia because Russia is a key, uh, you know, contributor to the real economy. Uh, you know, they have a ton of oil. They got, you know, um, now they're the second biggest producer and fertilizer, which everybody needs. And they need to destroy, you know, the food supply to make prices higher. Uh, so it's a great way to, you know, keep them out. Uh, of that and 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 of course like putin himself is you know uh, i in the in the least trust him at all i i don't trust any government officials uh because putin himself is you know former kgb guy you know he uh he's just another elitist uh of course but uh, but when you travel through russia like i have friends that have been through russia they're saying that actually russia is way more freer uh, in one sense because the the uh, the government itself if you're a small guy, if you're not one of the big oligarchs, you know, you, you don't have anything to worry about. You know, you don't get murdered or uh, or killed by the Russian government. Uh, you're actually having more of a free market interaction in, in the real economy. I had a friend of mine. Um, he, he was telling me he lived in Moscow. He He's a blockchain developer. But he was telling me how, you know, in Moscow, it's uh, it's mostly Moscow, St. Petersburg. That's the uh, big centers. Outside of that, it's... People don't have much money. Like they just work. They have regular, like uh, small jobs, small economies, small farms, and so on. And so Russia in itself is is quite strong in in one way because they're more decentralized. Um, and, and if you travel around Russia, like I lo love to watch even Russian movies. I only been to Murmansk, but if you travel around in Russia, you find that Russia is super decentralized. Other than, of course, the FSB facilities. You know, the, the nicest place in any town uh, that you travel to in Russia is the FSB building. They're, uh, you know, former KGB, basically. The, you know, they're former of CIA, I guess, CIA slash FBI. Um, but in, uh, in Russia itself, you know, it's it's all, I forgot grain, massive grain producer as well. So they, uh, they're kind of the breadbasket and they were the energy basket of Europe. They were feeding Europe. Well, then you had uh, you know a little plot. You know, uh, Putin bombed the uh, you know his own pipelines to Germany, <laughs> Nord Stream pipelines. Well, I was like, I I have another idea there because guess who's the head of NATO? And um, the Norwegian army is quite equipped to uh, do underwater work, if you uh, know what I mean. And so mm -hmm. I have a thought that the actual Norwegian army, uh, not the Swedish army at the time, because they are uh, not they were NATO, but the Norwegian and uh, and U.S. army probably had a little bit of fun. Uh, there's a lot of like vessels that was around there. They're trying to like make us follow breadcrumb trails to others. But I, I think it was mainly you know the um, a, a coalition between Norway and. Um, and the Norwegian military. When I was in the Norwegian military, I sent the spy satellites to look at Russian border facilities when they were building radars or other military uh, buildings or had equipment on the ground. It's just like you could see the the gravel on the ground with the U.S. satellite equipment. So it was uh, uh, the the Americans have been spying on Russia all the time. They want, uh, of course, a strong man like Putin now because he's. He's kind of pointing out, and if you look at listen to RT, except for the propaganda piece of RT, if you listen to Malta RT, it's it's just like pointing out the obvious problems in the Western world uh, that we have. But it's of course it's a, a state funded thing. But th th there's there's really a lot of issues. We were hitting peak debt, you know, in um, in most of Western countries. Like here in Canada, I think we're number five, if I'm not remembering wrong, in uh, private jet to GDP. Uh, my home country, Norway, is number two in the world. And we're so indebted. Everybody's so indebted. That's the private debt. Then you got the uh, the government debt. Uh, you know, on top of that, that is starting to get very indebted. Even Norway, during COVID, they had to spend, uh, get into a lot of debt, uh, the Norwegian government. They didn't spend it out of their oil fund, which lost a tremendous amount of money, uh, of course, during because they are 75% in stocks. You know, the Norwegian oil fund. You would think that they would hold oil futures or 
or have some from Bali or some gold in there, but of course they don't. Uh, and they have a lot of corp, uh, a lot of commercial real estate, which which you could probably talk about. That's going to be another hit to the original fund. So yeah, there, there's just bad around. Like I, I think we have so many debt bubbles that they can't stop it, you know, directly right now. And I think that's we're going to see that in most of the Western countries because we're so indebted. Like in Russia, they have barely any debt, and they actually live by the old principle. So you know. Uh, you never get into debt. You just save and then buy. You know they're savers in Russia. We are we are spenders and we're debt uh, debt collectors, if you can call it that. You know we we use debt to buy anything. So yeah, I I, I think we're heading uh, for a uh, total crisis. But I think you know the uh, Russia and Putin and then um, we got Xi Jinping. I just looked at like the new list for the young global leaders for the World Economic Forum as an example. And on that list, there was, uh, you know, 10, um, 10 Chinese. They've been vilifying the Chinese, but there was 10 Chinese and 10 Americans on there. So I guess the elites, you know, they, they see it differently. You know, they, uh, they have their communications between the two and they have all these people uh, that they uh, are, you know, who knows what they've done to them, have control over them. But they're settled, you know, in media and in government, in schools and uh, in the monitor system, in the banks, and so on, and they uh, they have a lot to say, and they went through a little, uh, you know, propaganda, uh, what do you call, uh, kind of five year program with the young global leaders. So they have a lot of uh, things to say, uh, and I think that's why you've seen like the 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 whole Western world is like talking everything, everybody's saying the same exact thing, and I think that's the coordination that happened to COVID and everything is that they've been become quite well uh, at what they're doing and. Uh, they have all their, you know, talking heads out there making sure that they're trying to push the agenda uh, and, and keeping control over, you know, the conversation uh, and then trying to stop any dissenting voices. But uh, again, you know, with today's technology, it's getting very hard for them to try to control. They tried it with YouTube. They tried, they deleted me and Josh off of YouTube in 2018. And uh, they're just trying to delete anybody with dissenting voices. Now they're angry at TikTok because TikTok is hilarious. If you look at TikTok here in Canada, it's so much anti-government propaganda on there right now, like from people that are saying the right things, you know, that, you know, government is very corrupt, but hmm. you can't say anything bad about the Chinese government. So it's a, it's exactly like uh, Facebook, but it's just they can't control it. So they're really mad at it and they want to ban it, you know. <laughs> but anyways, uh Back to you uh, on, you know, we, we, we talked about this and, and uh, what I see, but I, I think like the, the fraction, uh, fractioning that you're seeing is still like there's a lot of cooperation and the fractioning uh, and it's more of like trying to, because we're failing, you know, our monetary system, I think they're going to try to put together some kind of war scenario uh, with Russia. Now they have uh, no with China now uh, because they also have, you know, the Russian war so they could focus on that. There's also a war in Sudan right now that they're trying to get into. Uh, and we could talk about that. That's actually, I saw a Sheikh uh, that I have as a connection on LinkedIn. He was posting a very Im interesting um, picture of all the gold deposits in Sudan. And there's a lot of it in Sudan, apparently. And so uh, there's a lot. I think like what we're going to see, though, is as all this debt collapses, I think we're going to see what I call uh, the commodity wars 2030. Uh, where we're basically going to just fight over trying to have control over real things as the fake economy is collapsing. Very good. I want to circle back to a couple of things you pointed out. One, I picked up this expression from someone. I give him credit, but I have no idea who said it. But it's Russia is becoming the United States, and the United States is becoming Russia. <laughs> and yeah. that really makes yeah. a lot of sense if you know what's yeah. going on, because as you pointed out, Russia is actually pretty free for the commoner. And the United States is becoming more Orwellian by the day. Uh, I mean, you know, the bastion of, uh, the, you know, uh, the Bill of Rights. I mean, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, all this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is going bye bye. I mean, we're censored at almost every level as you pointed out you lost your youtube channel you and josh <clears throat> so i do think also the obvious is there but some people don't see it and i'll give the example of how many retails retail industries are failing or contracting i mean walmart which was like the go-to stock for decades 
uh, they're closing a bunch of uh, their stores. Uh, Best Buy, which is a big box store for electronics, like big screen TVs and uh, any electronic gizmo, cell phones, computers, any accessory to a computer like printers, huge stores. And many of those are being shuttered. Um, even like high-end stores for clothing, like Nordstrom's, uh, they're closing some of their stores. And I think the easiest way to describe it from my personal experience is when I was much younger and malls started to be built. In fact, I one of my investments as a younger guy was uh, financing <clears throat> as a partner, limited partner, into uh, in these shopping malls. And I remember probably in my 30s or something and seeing some of these huge malls in Los Angeles. And they were going over most of the country and they were just packed with, you know, 10 different, you know, three different shoe stores, three or five or six apparel stores, a candy store, uh, you, uh, you name it. And just tons of people mulling around, you know, the consumerism. I mean, at one yeah. point, and I'm not sure it's true right now, but 70% of the United States economy is based on consumerism. Well, I said all that as a background to say the mall that is in my town here, there's two of them actually. The one that's closest to me is barely alive. The, the AMC theater is still functioning. Uh, some manicure, pedicure places are there. Um, Nordstrom's gone. Uh, or excuse me, Macy's gone. Sears gone. These are the cornerstone yeah. stores, the big ones. You know, everyone went every you know, day, every weekend. They're gone. I mean, the mall is basically a ghost town. I mean, there's a couple. And, and like the food court, okay? I, I don't know. There's probably eight or nine food facilities in the food court now there's like four i mean the, the others are just boarded up i mean they have little paintings over them and stuff like you don't know there's supposed yeah. to be a food facility there <laughs> so that's not only a metaphor it's an analogy for what's really going on so you know the talking heads on the mainstream financial channels can squawk all they want about how great these numbers are on the financial system but it's not representing what's really going on. There is a large contraction and it's starting to accelerate. And people will do what you said. And I want to pick up on the other thread. And that is one of these books back here is called Resource Wars. And you outlined it perfectly. You know, we're getting from the time of, uh, you know, stuff we want to things we must or need. Yep. So it's going from kind of, you know, nice to have to absolute requirement. I mean, you got to have food, you got to have water, you got to have shelter uh, and, you know, utilities. I mean, look at what's going on in Europe with the uh, shutdown of uh, the normal flow of energy from Russia into, into Europe. And all these things are very, very important. And it seems as if the mainstream kind of glosses over them. They do report on them, they have to, but they don't really go deep and what it really means and what it means to the average person. And, you know, I said this in my newsletter about two years ago, and there's a Maverick economist, you may be familiar with his name, maybe not, he's long deceased, but his name was Elliot Janeway. And he was talking about the financial markets being one large speculative casino. Well, that was years ago before they're at the point we are now. But the quote I used was one that he said, and it goes like this, the next Great Depression will make the last Great Depression look like a small technical correction. So he saw yeah. the massive amount of misallocation of capital being so large that when you come through the pendulum swing to all the funny money back to reality, that it's going to basically wipe out a lot of a lot of productive capacity. I mean, as an adherent, pretty much to the Austrian school, I mean, I can find flaws in it, but uh, it's not my place. Certainly I'm no Von Mises or Lou Rockwell or anything, but <clears throat> the idea of capital is really the means of production. I mean, you've got to create wealth if you really want to have a wealthy economy. Yeah. Printing money does not create wealth. And yet, we sort of, or the governments pretend that it does. And of course it doesn't, it fails every time. And 
We're watching it fail before our eyes. I'll give it back to you, John. Well, I, I thought I saw a chart on uh, somebody posted a link that I think it showed the uh, growth over the last, I think, like 50 years or something in the United States. I forgot what it was, the time frame, but it showed like 79% of real GDP growth. And then the debt grew by 279%, uh, the public debt. And, and that just shows you where we're at. Now, if you look at history itself, you know, you have... Uh, times when we've had pure financialization. Uh, one of the big ones was the Mississippi bubble in France, uh, where mm -hmm. basically everybody, you know, when you get to the point in the economy where you just can make money with money, who cares about, you know, being an electrician or a farmer or, or doing real things in the economy? And we're seeing that right now. Like it's it's uh, dead front and center. We, we, we're not replacing our farmers. We're not replacing our blue collar workers, like plumbers, electricians, and and all that, uh, everybody wants to be influencers on, on some kind of social media platform uh, because that's where the money is, you know, getting uh, enough viewers. And and of course, they're going to have a very tough reality probably in like, uh, who knows, it could be very soon, it could be in five, ten years, but they're going to realize that uh, maybe they need to be farmers, electricians and, and plumbers and so on to actually keep society from complete utter collapse because we need, we need the real people in the real economy because uh, if we don't have them, we're not going to feed ourselves, first of all. Uh, it's going to be quite devastating, I think. But uh, I, I talked to a guy, and, and he just recently passed away, and he had some really great points. He's a uh, You might have met him, Timothy Ball, a uh, former climatologist from Manitoba here, and, uh, and um, he's been uh, to the Red Pill Expo and spoken there with uh, Jennifer Griffin and so on. But we actually, I, I sat down and talked to him, but we actually didn't talk too much about climate. What we talked about was the collapse of civilizations. And a lot of times, uh, almost every time, it's the centralization of uh, everybody into cities. Uh, and then suddenly everybody forgets to feed themselves and uh, like, or don't have enough. And then a, a crisis happened in the city, for example. And then you don't have a decentralized economy around you. Everybody's not, like feeding themselves, you know, uh, planting things or having things, uh, uh, you know, in their gardens or, you know, chickens or, or cows or whatever they, uh, they have to feed themselves. And then suddenly you get a mass uh, civiliz uh, civilizational collapse because the food supply can't, you know, uh, keep on, you know, having the, uh, the, uh, the amount of population on on earth at the time and but that comes with you know uh, uh back in the day was might have been a little bit different uh you know we hadn't you know figure out financialization in the Aztec, like when uh, uh when the uh, egyptian empires or the Cambodian empires like way back in the day two thousand uh, three four thousand years ago but you know it, it was that centralization that happens uh through civilizations uh, and on top of that, in the modern economies, you know, the last uh, since the Roman Empire, really, is that centralization, uh, then, uh, you know, with then financialization of, of things and then misuse of, of the currency, you know, in the old days in the Greek and Roman empires, they debased currency by taking out, you know, the metals uh, of the gold and silver coinage. Uh, and now they're just printing currency out of uh, out of thin air and then going into a whole bunch of debt like that started. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, through the banking, when banking was created in Venice. But uh, another one that nobody's really talked about is the Chinese empires. They had five big Chinese empires. The first one was the Song Dynasty. And I actually have a plate, uh, a replica plate of the first ever, uh, uh, you know, printed paper currency of the Song Dynasty in 1024. And it's funny that we have the thousand year anniversary of paper currency. Maybe that will be when... You know, because the elites are elites, maybe that's when they want to do the reset into a digital world, fully digital world. Who knows, right? But um, I, I think, um, like throughout history, and that Song Dynasty, actually, they had debt at the time, too. And they had a peak debt of the... So, so what happens every time is you hit a peak, and then you, when you issue debt, and you also charge interest on it, it comes a point when you can't supply the Ponzi scheme anymore. You can't get enough debtors to supply... More debt, you know, to keep the the system alive, to keep on paying the 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 um, interest on it. And so, like, what happens is you just hit a peak where nobody can't afford anymore. And then, especially now that we're you know slowly heading into a, a contraction in in even uh, human supply of of new humans that could get into debt, uh, I I think we're gonna 
like even the monetary engineers are not going to be able to save anybody from the utter disaster that's coming with you know hitting that peak debt and then it just imploded and that, i think that's what that m2 uh decrease is showing us is that we hit that peak we can't go any further and especially now that interest rates went up to five percent you know the the official interest rate anyways uh i think that really because last time gotta remember in 2019 they got up to two 2.25 was it or 2.5 i think it was the federal reserve and then the whole banking system imploded in the repo crisis you know when when um jp morgan and every single uh, globally systemically important bank had to get bailed out uh in by the federal reserve through you know the first the repo then uh, outright purchases through quantitative easing of course um but i think we hit that point where uh, Every sector, you know, like go and look at any sector, you know, the automobile, credit card, you look at corporate debt, you look at private, uh, you know, uh, personal debt, you look at public debt. I think we're hitting that peak where uh, we just can't supply, especially now that interest rates went up. Uh, it's just now imploding. Uh, and I think the Federal Reserve, the local petro planners, they don't know the insane disaster that's coming that's ahead of them. I, I, I think uh, maybe they know. Maybe they were prepared to just bring out, uh, you know, the monetary bombers or whatever. But I, I, I just don't know how they're gonna get away with this one. But yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, some of the points that I made, there, uh, David. Well, several. One is um, going back to Elliot Janeway he said, "Well, you, we know we're at the end when you and I are sitting across the table from each other, selling each other life insurance." So in other words, as you said earlier, when you think all you have to do is make money with money, then why would you go to work? You know, and of course, without, you know, real labor and real capital formation, you have a very large decrease in society at large. Another thing is what you said about the debt versus the amount of productive capacity. I think it was 79 and 279. And this shows you that there is constructive use of debt. I mean, you can go in and borrow, you know, X amount. And if you create two X out of X, you have used that capital in a very good way. And you have done um, something worthwhile, let's say. But there was an Austrian, I forget his name. He wrote a newsletter. He's, he's been gone for a while, but he was talking about for every dollar <clears throat> Uh, you have to borrow five dollars, and maybe it's three. You use two seventy nine, but four or five dollars for every dollar of productive capacity. Well, that's the way to go broke. I mean, if you're a gambler and you have to borrow five bucks to win one, you're not going to be in the gambling business very long. And that's what we're doing, as you pointed out. So that was another thought that came up. I think lastly is the idea that. This is not anything new. I like the fact that you talked about the paper currency. I remember, first of all, in my book, The Silver Manifesto, we go through a lot of that Chinese monetary history, by the way. Coming back, one of the earliest things I learned when I embarked on this study was that Marco Polo came back from Asia. And the thing he couldn't believe was that the Chinese used paper money and considered it to be final payment. Yeah. It was just unconscionable to him because everything was settled in real money at that time in Europe, but not in China. And of course, again, to repeat, the point you're making is it's not new. It's happened again and again and again. But what worried me from you know, my perspective is that I've never seen it globally before. And nope. I've never seen 100%. it in such an advanced economy as we have and such an interconnected uh, the codependent, I'll call it, economy. I mean, we can't run things without, you know, importing a lot of stuff. We're, and, and most countries, maybe save Russia, <clears throat> are similar. Uh, Russia could probably self-sustain, but many countries couldn't. And so we are interdependent. And as the trust breaks down, and you look again at what we talked about earlier, where the U.S. basically sanctioned Rust and said, your money's no good. Well, what do other countries think? Are they going to do that to us? You know, as it's called, weaponizing the dollar. I mean, if you can use that as a implementation of you do our will or die, uh, that scares a lot of countries. So 
And yeah, it worked. Point, it worked for a while. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> the last point, and I'm still thinking about it, is: Do they really know how to implement the, the Great Reset, or are they just so arrogant that they think they can hire a bunch of pro programmers to come up with the CBDC with the stroke of a pen, say all cryptos are null and void except for these three? And um, and move everyone into the new system. And the answer I have is I don't think it's it's going to be implemented that that well. And the last thing is a non sequitur, John, but now a powerful you think and you know contemplating this again and again and looking at different scenarios and starting with a different premise. You know, there's some patriots probably up at the top level of these programs. And who's to say that someone hadn't slipped something in there that, uh, you know, after six months, this thing self-destructs, bombs, uh, <laughs> siphons off. <laughs> Who knows? But, you know, there's always resistance when tyranny strikes. And um, it's all over the world. I mean, and, and what really upsets them is they really can't control people as much as they can punish them and take away their privileges of, get into apartment. I'm talking China with the social credit score. Let me yeah. be exact. So you got a social credit score. It goes down. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank. If the government says you're persona non grata, then you might not be able to travel, you know, buy a car, get an apartment, go to a certain school, go to a certain restaurant or any of that stuff. So you don't have financial freedom. You have a lot of money, but with a low social credit score, you it's as if they don't have any money because you can't access it. The government can turn it off. And this amount of control is absolutely absurd, but this is what they are facing. And I think the rest of the planet is at some point, which means that there will be a resistance. I'm sure there still is in China, even though, you know, you, it's going to be detrimental to your personal situation, but there are people that, uh, well, look at the, look at the COVID yeah. pushback. Look at the COVID pushback. Like, did you see all the videos? So, you know, they just said, like, enough is enough. And then, like, even though, like, a communist government can't be wrong, he actually he had to back out of his zero COVID insanity. Yes, that's right. I'll give it back to you. I mean, you have a lot of great thoughts. And I, you know, I'm very concerned about what the future looks like. But I'm also... um Look at the other side, which means there is a, a great pushback uh, and there will be, and they might just issue it and it doesn't work. I mean, these people are not very, um, they're very clever, but they're really not good at doing anything in the, in the real world, in the physical economy, because you've got our Federal Reserve Board and they're all academics. They haven't run a lemonade stand. They don't really know how markets work. They think they know how the money supply works. They think they're they right about to, it somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> control it through fiscal and monetary policy, yeah. but they really don't know. And the markets have a mind of their own. And we're in a situation I just described where there's a huge contraction in the physical economy. That's the real world. Forget the financial. World. Yeah, and you could be you could have uh, as much, uh, you know. Uh, of a growth in the the financial economy, like look at uh, look at places uh, you know that are great at you know we had huge um, increases in the uh, indexes for you know the Venezuelan exchange in Caracas. You had the same in in Buenos Aires, you know, uh, happening with Argentinian stock exchange in Turkey. You know, stock exchange is performing very well. But the the thing is, the real economy and the currency that the people make in the economy is not doing that well. Uh, people in, in Turkey just recently, they're moving all their savings. Usually when they spent uh, most of their money that they spend right away, they spend it on uh, on whatever they can get. And then they say whatever they save, they don't save it in Turkish lira. They save it either in used dollars, uh, euros or gold. Uh, so they uh, they know as well. Like, And that's one of the problems with any of these fiat currencies that you see on the walls behind me here. Uh, and, you know, the only thing that they live and, and die upon is trust. And when that trust is broken, every single fiat currency that I looked at, that I've seen that have failed, and every everyone fails at one point, it's all about the trust of the value. And when that's broken, it takes about uh, sometimes just one month, but at the most six months until 
that currency is completely gone because what happens is people will then you know try to get rid of their currency they have all their savings let's say in things and they're trying to just get out of those savings so uh, let's say that um, they have a lot of them in in you know the local currency they're trying to get rid of it and then suddenly you get a huge shock in the economy in inflation and then that inflationary shock just like everybody loses faith in in the value of the currency because let's say you know, suddenly it was 100, 200, 300% shock because you had a mass supply of currency coming and chasing real things because people are panicking. They want to get out of it. And then that will then instill the loss of trust. And then people then suddenly uh, try to get rid of as much as they can to get. But then suddenly businesses stop paying, you know, their employees in the currency because like, why would you? Why would you give your uh, employees or why would you even take the currency when it's losing value so rapidly? And then they would try to find alternate ways of, of, of either barter or they would use gold, silver or, or any other currency that might be of value. But now all of them are basically struggling at the same time globally. Uh, so they would try to get out of it. Uh, and then what would happen is the government is not going to get any taxable income because they're dependent on everybody using their currency as the weapon of taxation, being able to tax people, the power of taxing people in it. And so what happens is that in Venezuela, you know, when they had their collapse, the government just had to print oblivious amounts of currency. And they had their own their second hyperinflation in in Venezuela, because the first one, you know, the, the Venezuelan uh, Bolvar's Ferreira failed, which was their first currency. Then they created the Bolvar's Soberano, and the Soberano is now hyperinflating uh, because nobody's trusting that it has value. And the government still has to print it because they're going to have to spend it, uh, And but nobody wants to use it. And, and so that's what happens is uh, the government could, you know, try to tax as much as they want, but nobody is willing. To, and their power was in being able to tax and... They had the monopoly on the currency, but now that they don't anymore, uh, you know, that just brings them into that hyperinflationary state where the government just got to print atrocious amounts of currency to then not go bankrupt, basically, at the point or to try to sustain itself. But that usually either it ends in, in an economic collapse or it ends in a war a lot of times where they just cover up, you know, their losses through going to war against someone Uh and um, I think that's going to be, you know, the most likely outcome. You're talking about CBDCs that have failed. There, there was one in Ecuador from 2014 to 2018. Uh, they tried to implement it. Maybe they were early because it wasn't so digital yet, but uh, nobody wanted to use it. So the, the government just had to give it up. Um, and I think that that is our hope is that, uh, you know, why do we even care about this? Uh, like we have our system today. We could, as you said at the start, you could still get censored. You could still get locked out of it. So why would we care? Uh, and I, I think that people are, are waking up more and more because the central bank digital currency, it, it was in the, the manifesto, as I call for cashless by Kenneth Rogoff called The Curse of Cash. And uh, uh, his book in, from 2016, he said it himself. The number one reason for C he didn't say the word CBDC didn't exist yet. The number one reason for going cashless is tax uh, collection. You know, because they want to more effectively collect taxes because they looked at countries that have the highest taxes, like Norway. Actually, Turkey didn't doesn't have as much taxes, but they have a huge black market. But in in, in France and Norway, Finland and Sweden, uh, they uh, we have we had like 20 percent to 30 percent of the economy is black because nobody wants to work for taxable income because the taxes. My mom pays 51 percent tax as a cleaning lady. She recently retired. 51% as a cleaning, she doesn't even own her own business as a cleaning lady. She's so employee. Uh, and so just the insanity of that. But now you're seeing in Norway, you know, uh, inflation, like food inflation was 70%, uh, uh, 30 to 70% of most products. Even the newspapers had to admit to it. And so I think what you're seeing with that and then also food getting too expensive and when when people can't feed themselves, that's when you get the Arab Spring. You know, that's in 2011. That was food inflation that created that. Sure. And so I think we're going to see that a mass. Uh, and I, 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 you know, these guys, I think they have a utopian idea. They, they all talk together. That's a problem. It's like, uh, you know, they're all hanging out at the same meetings. They go and hang out together all the time up in Davos or wherever. They go in these think tanks. But they never talk to people with other ideas, uh, it seems right. like. It's never seen because I, I would have a LinkedIn and I talk about these ideas to a lot of these elitists out there. They're shocked because they never heard about it. 
like the you know any type of anarcho capitalist ideas or any you know uh, uh libertarian type of ideas they don't they, they haven't even heard about them a lot of times because they were indoctrinated in the in the in the same system that these elites try to control but i think Having that utopian idea with AI controlling everything, I, I think that's a pipe dream that will never happen in reality. I, I really hope so. And I hope it just uh, falls flat on its face and then we get back to being more decentralized as a society. And we, I, I think we still will have technology. Uh, of course, I don't think we're going to go back to the Stone Ages. Uh, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, we might revert back, hopefully. But you never know. They try really hard to... This, Pendulum might swing all the way to totalitarianism before we come back uh, when it collapses in on itself. Yeah, I don't have a lot to comment. I'll just pick up a couple of things. Number one, war. Yeah, I think that's, you know, we're in one and it'll probably uh, unfortunately get worse. And then really it's an excuse. I did a, a series uh, in my newsletter and also in a couple of interviews uh, based on Rivera's work, all wars are banned bankers wars and uh, the banks take either side and they make money it's a very profitable enterprise i mean i'm i'm a peace monger but and i just have to give an aside john but uh, one of my listeners wrote me an email and he said my 14 year old son was in class and was asked something about war and he told the teacher all wars are bankers wars <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. You know, that's what they need now. Uh, in today's, you know, uh, propagandist educational system, that's wonderful to hear that, you know, the old books of bankers, well, that's fantastic, 14-year-old. That's, that's oh. nice. Yeah, uh, no, the I, other thing, I, I want to get your opinion on this, because this is one I still, I guess I'll say struggle with. I mean, if you look at the way the system is structured, in, in very advanced capital markets like we've had for years, <clears throat> you've got a debt market. And we know debt's the problem. But if the bond, the U.S. bond failed, that would be a huge contraction in you know, what we'll consider assets. I mean, all debt gets paid. I mean, one of the series of books back here that I've read some of them more than once is um, Vern Myers that came from Canada. He was a, a financial newsletter writer, long deceased, actually moved to Spokane for a while. But he talks about all debts are paid. Either, you know, the borrower or the lender gets, you know, had. He might get 10 cents on the dollar. He might get zero, but something happens to that debt. And, you know, the the norm is to hyperinflate away, which I do think is probably the course of action that will take place. But if, what would you think if we had a mass, let's say we defaulted on the debt, the yeah. U.S. debt. So we've got this debt ceiling limit that's, just a joke. I mean, I forget how many years ago this debt limit was passed because we're going to get our fiscal house in order and can't <laughs> raise the debt anymore. We're going to have to pay our bills as we're due and life is good. We're going to correct it. Well, once that was enacted, it's never been implemented. Every time that the debt ceiling is reached, yeah. the Congress critters come in and they vote for a new debt limit. Well, this time, and I think it's propaganda. I mean, I really do think before the inevitable they will raise the debt limit. So let me be clear on that. But as a thought experiment, let's say they don't. And all of a sudden, you know, there's starting to be some uh, some implementation of uh, the credit markets freezing up. Uh, what, what do you think would happen if you had a large contraction, let's say, in the government bond market, let alone the corporate bond market? Um, oh, yeah. That'd be highly deflationary, right? Oh, it definitely would. Like, what's interesting right now, actually, I, I do follow the Fed uh, almost on a daily basis and what they do. And I haven't, like, so I, I follow them and I watch their uh, treasury sales or purchases. And you know what? I only seen two official mortgage-backed security sales and two official treasury sales, like they're called outright sales. And I have seen no other sales, but their balance sheet has been contracting. So to me, it just means that are they just letting it run off so like they come do the the debt and then they just don't pay it you know to the but the, the fed holds it so who cares right uh right. I, I think that's probably what's going to happen the, i i wrote an article in tw i think it was 2017 and i called it the federal reserve will own everything then nothing 
<laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I and I think that's probably most likely because I looked at you know what happened in Japan in the 1980s, um, and of course there they had to bail out like they bought 86 percent almost of the ETF market uh, because the ETFs collapsed because. In ETFs, like looking at the market, you have to like basically be able to uh, to sell it to someone. But the problem is when everybody is selling in an ETF, let's say everybody's in, you know, the S&P 500, what is it, QQQ or whatever it's called, right? When everybody right, sits there and every, everybody wants to sell uh, that ETF because they want to exit, well, who's going to buy it? There's the, like, I have a friend of mine, he's a former Fidelity um, fund manager. He, he ran their growth fund from 400 million up to 8 billion. Uh, his name is uh, Chris Galizio. And um, he was telling me it's like, it, it's basically 85% is uh, now, you know, passive investors, and then 15% is active. So when those passive investors are going to try to sell anything, you know, who's going to buy it? It's going to have to be the Fed, not the 50%. They might not even want it, you know, the active investors uh, when that happens. And and I think they're just going to have to buy all the ETFs. They're going to, maybe they're just going to stocks, but I think they're just going to buy the ETFs. That's going to be the big thing. And they could do what uh, Norgus Bank did in Norway. They bought 3% of the stock market during COVID to prop it up. Uh, and so I, I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, back to debt, they're just going to keep on buying that debt. Um, like nobody's gonna go bankrupt uh, in you know the terms that we're gonna have an actual uh, fiscal default. I think I I think that's near zero as a chance, you know. But if it happened, you know, it, it'd be fantastic. You could have a real uh, you know shakeup. You know, looking at the AAA rated nations that's still left, I'm I'm surprised. I I wrote a comment the other day. It's like, hey, I'm surprised that anybody even still have A, you know, in in any rating. Right. Uh, of course, sure. and 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 if you look at the corporate debt, there's like forty plus percent of corporate debt that sits right at triple B, because it's like uh, then it's not junk. <laughs> yeah. Know? So I, I I think it's just gonna, I yeah. In the tech, like if that happened, that you had an actual fiscal default on on you know the bonds, I I, I think it would just destroy like uh, and have a massive deflationary event. I really love to see that you know that we had a deflationary event and. But then we still have the same financial system at the end of it. You know, we could go all right. the way to the end, but then we're going to start contracting and expanding again at one point. And you still sit on the same corrupt Ponzi scheme type of uh, structure of a system. So I think that's, uh, you know, even though if it happened and we went back, like back to the natural state of the system, you still have a system. The business cycle is basically we ran out of money. We got into peak debt in a, in a sector of the economy. And now there's not enough and more debt to be issued out. So you basically can't pay all the debt and then you falter. It's it's like it's built in as a Ponzi scheme in itself. You need all those people. And then when there's too many people that have gotten into debt, you know, the only the people that doesn't really have debt is going to be the winners. And uh, I, I think that's where like if we had that default, I, I think it would be fantastic, wonderful. But I think you see so much social unrest. <laughs> right. And, and you know the the pitchforks will be out because uh, what are people going to do with all their pensions? You know that's what I'm looking at with all these pensions full of you know bonds and and stocks. Is like uh, yeah, when uh, when shit hits the fan, that that's going to be a bad thing. Uh, but I think they're going to do whatever it takes uh, to keep propping that up. Like even if you had like they think that they're going to default, they would bail everybody out left right and mm -hmm. center they would do whatever it takes like it's uh if you watch the hidden secrets of money you know they would mm -hmm. just do whatever it takes whatever it takes uh and it wouldn't stop until they think that they could fix it but they're not going to be able to fix it the fix is going to be complete utter collapse and trust of the value of our current monetary system and, and it would fail i what i really want to see at that time then is uh like you could die that the fraction or collapse but I, I think it's just not possible in the way because everybody is just believes that, oh, we got to bail everybody out every single time that something bad happens because we can't let, you know, uh, real, real uh, e economics take hold. And, and uh, you actually wouldn't, you know, be able to gamble at the casino and then just have the casino give you more money. You know, if the casino just stop giving you that money and uh, being asking for, you know, all the debt back, uh, I think you would stop gambling pretty quickly. Uh, but, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately, that scenario per se, you know, where you're going to have a, a fiscal default from the United States or any of the 
triple A rated nations around the world. They, they, they might demote them, but um, but you could, you know, it's it, nothing is impossible, of course. Maybe they would get through the census and want that system to collapse back uh, so they could then, you know, uh, be able to say, like, oh, we saved everybody now. But um, yeah, I, I just don't see that with the current behavior. And, and it all comes back to that 2002 speech of Ben Bernanke. Uh, where he said uh, at the at the Fed, he was the Federal Reserve Chair at the time, but he said that uh, you know uh, deflation will always be cured by the printing press. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll back you up. I mean, yeah. I just wanted your thoughts on it. Yeah. But a um, friend of mine in the financial industry, he's well respected, did a study one summer on his kind of his sabbatical vacation, and he read something like I don't know, twelve books. And he determined that every time that the monetary system was a fiat-based system, that was hyperinflated away. Yeah. The only time you had a debt liquidating the pressure was like in the 30s where gold was the most. Yeah, and, and it so, could. Yeah. Yeah, it could when you had, uh, you know, actual, not, because it doesn't have a counterparty. Gold is not, like, right. it's gold. <laughs> like, there's right. no there's no asset liability there. There's just an asset. And... Um, so I yeah I, I think I think probably what will happen that maybe they would try to go to gold standard but why would you trust like it's the Zimbabwean uh, government now is trying to go to CBDC back gold standard like why would you trust the Zimbabwean government you know like they they screwed up they they screwed up their second currency now they're you know it's funny they they revalued the the Zim dollar and then paid people out in dollars I remember like this. This uh, 100 trillion, and I, I'm sure you have a few of those as well. They used yeah. to be worth like I, I bought them in, you know, like the big uh, stacks, but now they're actually like 200 and something, I think, per uh, per uh, note because they revalued and then everybody just took back like I think it was like 37 uh, trillion to, you know, uh, seven dollars or something ridiculous like that. But uh, and, and then, of course, like five years after, guess what came out? The new Zim dollar. And then it's just hyperinflating again so it's uh you know like let's talk uh, I, we have just a little bit of time left i think we should talk about the more important things there is like what what do we do you know uh to protect ourselves through this time because uh we could you know be all the kind of investors we want uh but you know it all comes down to reality when when an actual system when you have a real systematic collapse we're seeing banks are now collapsing because of you know, the, the bonds mismanagement, you know, and, and all the stuff. I, I think we have a systemic, uh, you know, collapse that are coming. And and what can we do to protect ourselves? Because, I well, both you and me know what we are going to do, but I think it's important uh, to reiterate, you know, like I, I say it all the time, but I think it's important to reiterate a little bit of what people can do, you know, in order to protect themselves from uh, the, the utter disaster that will uh come no matter if it's deflationary or inflationary right well number one is to be debt free which is yeah. extremely hard for most people because you know we're taught to live off of debt and that's the whole system but you know you can get out of debt and maybe better said live within your means um you know it was kind of i was brought up with parents that were uh depression types my grandmother actually went through the depression my dad was born in 1930 but uh, certainly that uh, got into their consciousness, especially my mom, because they, that, their family you know, struggled at times. So be self-reliant, be more connected to your community. Uh, I think having a, a real needed skill, like we talked about earlier in your show, you know, if you can farm, if you can garden, if you can repair an automobile, if, if you can fix plumbing, if you can weld, if you can... Um, do any of those things, uh, maybe as an advocation, maybe you're, uh, I don't know, maybe work at a bank, but you also have the ability to, uh, you know, be a part-time plumber. That's a very highly valued um, enterprise or, or job that uh, not many people can do. I mean, we're so um, set up to do something very specialized in our culture now. Uh, especially in the West, but the East as well. Yeah. And so most people are not, you know, handymen or handy women where they can do almost anything. I mean, going back to my childhood, 
my dad could do darn near anything. You know, it was a part-time carpenter, part-time plumber. He could weld, not well, but you know, the kind of welding we did, he didn't fix cars, but just about everything else. But all that has been pretty much lost on a lot of our generations. There's still, you know, men and women out there that can do that, but they're rare. Yeah. They're rare. And that was kind of the culture not that long ago. So I would say that would be an area. And the other one is, I think, on a spiritual basis. I think we've had too much for too long, and it's been taken for granted. And you don't need a lot of stuff to have a happy life. Uh, certainly, you got to eat. But, you know, look at, look at the corruption throughout the system. And, John, you know all this. I'm just saying it to the audience. Yeah. And, but it bears repeating. I mean, not only is the government corrupt, but the food supply is corrupt. Oh, yeah. And so you got a bunch of people that are overfed but undernourished because the nutrient value in the processed food chain is so ridiculously small that people keep overeating because their body keeps telling them, I need to be nourished, but there isn't nourishment in the product. Yeah. You got water that's polluted, the air is polluted, you've got built in obsolescence, you know, where these doodads and gizmos and whatever are built to fail after a certain amount of time. Again, it's 70% of the U.S. Uh, consumer is the basis of the economy. Yeah. So I think it's taking a solid inventory of where you are, you know, what kind of a living do you make, and, and is it one that could be replaced by AI? Is it something that could be replaced by robotics? And look for another skill set. Always your passion if you have one. Um, you know, always encourage people to do that. And uh, one I've said many times that it sounds corny, but it's actually a very, I think it's a great idea. And that is with the uh, illness situation, a lot of people started working from home. So there's a lot of families with two cars. Kick one car out. It's a liability. It's not an asset. So yeah. sell that darn thing. Yeah, it's more inconvenient. There's only one car and mama wants to go to the store and dad wants to take junior to the ball game or whatever but it can be done believe me there were you know when i grew up we finally had became a two-car family but you know we survived with one car i mean people survive with no cars so just look at what you could do for your own what we call personal balance sheet and get it you know right and so i had to go off topic here john because i've thought of this i've never said it on a program and, and you know we get along pretty well but there's this big talk about the fed contracting their balance sheet and I say all the Fed has to do to, to contract their balance sheet is mark all that crap they have on it to market. Oh, yeah. Market yeah, yeah market. there you go. The, <laughs> the balance sheet would drop to like 10% of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, we live in a crazy world. But, uh, you know, again, I, I think it's so important to, uh, like I, I tried to say it in one simple word, is like get your uh, – uh, especially your financial self off the financial grid and get uh, get as much as uh, of yourself off the grid. You know, don't be, uh, uh, you know, don't need to go to the store every 10 minutes, you know, have have stuff at home. And uh, as we talked about, you know, you have those things prepared for yourself. I'm I'm working really hard on getting uh, bigger and, and more of that as well for myself. So I'm uh, a lot more self-sufficient, but I'm, 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 you know, like getting there pretty well as well. And um, I, I think that everybody, like I, I talked to, like during COVID, I talked to a lot of uh, people and, and a lot of people approached me. Some people actually uh, took advice that I gave them and said, like, get out of the cities, you know, get out of the big centralized hubs. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I had a few people that really is just saying, like, that that just made my, uh, you know, life into a, it's just like a big weight off my shoulders you know just to uh get out there and live in nature but also then feel self-sufficient feel that you you know you, you don't really have to work if you had had to you know um you, you're not dependent on that debt or you're not dependent on you know uh finding that food you you have it right there uh, there and then and and you're not worried about you know the only thing you need to worry about is natural disasters um, and uh, not the fiscal disasters that we're heading towards. So I think just, I, I think like as a humanity, I think we need to get more back to our, uh, to ourselves, you know, as you know, you said where we used to be, where 
uh, our financial system has destroyed everything. It's poisoned our food. It's you know destroyed our 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 uh, uh, you know cars and destroyed our uh, our equipment that we use. Like it's it's worthless like within years basically, and, and it's just to use and throw. Uh, why you know like but that was fiat currency that did that. In my opinion, anyways, I know people might have different opinions on it, but I think a hundred percent you could almost every single time you could revert back to and see that it was a, a poisoning of the system as as you could say by you know having a toxic monetary system you know to run it all and and I think we're we're heading back to that you know getting closer to nature again and and reality basically i, I it might be a very rude awakening for a lot of people, but uh I think that might be a lot better for everybody. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to go back to the Stone Age and everybody's going to live on farms and, and we're not going to travel or we're not going to communicate or have YouTube, like have our you know platforms or whatever. But I, I, I do think that the big centralization event, we need to get away from that. We need to decentralize ourselves. And as you say, know your community and and get like get, get a lot smaller. Why do we need these big centralized hubs of control? That cities are, or the big governments, uh, we definitely don't need them whatsoever. We we could make buy with the extremely limited amount of governance if you really want to have a government around you. So I I think that's the way to go. I think we need to just look at ourselves and, and as you said, do that assessment on ourselves and 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 get prepared and and uh, just uh, connect more back to reality and and uh, you know back to social life and to. Uh, and to our uh, roots as human beings, you know, on this planet. Um, you know, I'm, uh, people might say, like, uh, I sound like a crazy environmentalist, but, you know, like, the pollution is real, you know, but not the mm -hmm. CO2 garbage <laughs> talking about, right. but uh, pollution is real. So, but that was also created and made available by, you know, the fiat currency system devaluing itself uh, again. So, uh, yeah, just, just try to get more back to uh, you know your human roots as a human being and and uh, and be a valuable asset to the world around you and i think uh you're gonna do very very well throughout this it, it might be uh, some darkness that we might entering into but there's a huge bright light at the end of uh, the hum humanity's tunnel i think i agree with you yeah, yeah. well said well, yeah, let's let's end it at that. Uh, if you uh, first, before we leave, uh, make sure that our viewers know where to go to find all your content and everything, uh, David. So if you could let them know where everyone could find everything about you and then uh, we'll call it a day. All right. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I mean, it ebbs and flows. Like when I went to the money show, I wasn't tweeting every day, but and that's at Silver Guru 22. That's my Twitter handle. And I've got a check mark. I've got a few uh, intruders that uh, use a handle very similar to that and uh, scam people. One guy was pretty good at it, getting a fair <laughs> amount of followers, and it was some crypto ripoff that he was pushing. So at Silvergood 22 is Twitter. I have a YouTube channel called The Morgan Report. I've got the website, themorganreport.com, and get on our free list, as I said earlier. And if you just go to the main site, the landing page, themorganreport.com, go to the blog. Pull down the blog tab and uh, you'll see all the all the interviews I do in the public domain. Uh, and there's also a search engine. And one I would encourage uh, your viewers to check out would be uh, on the search engine, type in uh, crypto conspiracy. I did 29 or 30 interviews and I give kind of an inside track on Bitcoin, on where it came from, who really instigated it, uh, the ties to Jeffrey Epstein and MIT on Bitcoin, uh, what he had to say about it being a better investment than gold, and a lot of these things that um, people are really unaware of. And uh, some of this was fed to me by a guy named John Perez. And John was kind of biting my ear, but I'm open-minded. I didn't know, yes, no, or whatever. I already had suspicions about Bitcoin. I wrote an article, my two bits about Bitcoin in 2014. And every time I reread it, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but it's pretty insightful. I said that Bitcoin really does take off. Look off, look out, because governments want monopoly. They're you know going to do something about it. So John brought some of this stuff to my attention, and no one was really taking the other side of the coin, pun intended, on Bitcoin. So I started, and uh, we called the top. We said you know 67,000 was it. 
and you know got the hate mail it's going to 125 000. everyone's number was 125 000. and i said nope this is it and so i went through that and then on um interview i think number 14 there's a gentleman named kurt wukert and he's the coin geek and he's an archivist for bitcoin he really knows his stuff so i brought him on with john i did a three-way interview and i said kurt am i full of crap i mean i've researched this stuff pretty darn well and it looks like bitcoin has been uh, usurped by the mastercard people he said oh, absolutely you're right so just about every assertion i had made and researched and validated to my satisfaction he verified for me. so this whole cryptocurrency thing whether it start with the nsa or not i'm not certain it looks like it perhaps did and it might have just been that uh, that problem reaction solution that gets us to where the bankers want to take us next with this central bank digital currency. Oh, crypto doesn't work, but ours will, and on and on it goes. So I could go on a little further, John. I think I'm done. Thank you for having me on. And uh, always uh, appreciate having a conversation. I never look at this as an interview because of your insightfulness. I'm glad we're friends. Um, say hi to Josh. I haven't seen him in a while. I haven't been to too many. Yeah. Uh, out of country shows lately, but um, you're both doing a fantastic uh, job for humanity, and uh, and that's what we need. We need men and women that will, you know, talk truth to power. Yeah. And the truth is very powerful, and people resonate with it, especially now when they know something's wrong. It's like the yeah. Matrix, right? There's something wrong. You felt it your whole life, but you don't know what it is, but it's there, and yeah. that's what's brought you to me. So that's what brings people to your channel. <laughs> no, 100%, uh, David, you know, truth is power, and that's been shown throughout history, the people that spoke truth broke through massive barriers through through history, so even though it was very dark places when it was spoken, they, uh, they sure won, so yeah, let's end it at that, I, I really appreciate having you on again, uh, David, it's always uh, very insightful, and uh, and I really enjoy uh, having you as a friend, uh, David, and, and talking about these important, because Having a conversation like this rather than an interview that you see, you know, a 10 or five minute snippet of uh, you or anybody else on, on the financial media, it's, it doesn't get us anywhere in life. It's these type of conversations that really push the, push the nail forward and, and uh, bring us, I think, into a, a more positive direction of humanity. So thank you again for uh, coming on, uh, David, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you.